Welcome to the Mailman School of Public Health's Grand Rounds on the Future of Public Health. I'm Linda Freed, and I have the honor of being today's moderator, as well as being the Dean at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Today, we are focused on COVID. As COVID cases, hospitalizations, and death tolls rise across our country, we brace ourselves for a very challenging and possibly grim next few months. The light at the end of the tunnel, the potential for consistent national leadership and alignment, depoliticizing the science and practice of both public health and medicine, the potential for vaccines that have demonstrated effectiveness in rigorous evaluation. This year, we have devoted our Grand Rounds series to understanding the evidence as to what we need in a public health system in the United States to meet our 21st century challenges and needs, and what we can do now to strengthen the one we have so that we are better prepared and protected for this pandemic and the next one. Our previous guests this year have included the New York State Commissioner of Health, Howard Zucker, two of New York City's former health commissioners and a leader for Medicare. It seems fitting to end 2020 with one of the most scientifically respected and knowledgeable leaders and trustworthy voices on COVID-19 for our nation, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci has served as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the U.S. National Institutes of Health since 1984. He leads an extensive research portfolio of basic clinical, population-based, and translational research to advance the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of long-standing as well as novel infectious diseases from HIV AIDS to COVID-19 and beyond. An eminent scientist and highly regarded clinician, Dr. Fauci is also the steady voice of science for the public good in our COVID-19 storm. I am pleased to share that President-elect Biden has asked Dr. Fauci to remain in his position and serve as the chief medical advisor for the President-elect's COVID-19 team. Dr. Fauci, we are so very honored to have you join us today. Thank you for your leadership and for speaking with us. For our audience, Dr. Fauci will provide an opening presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer session where I will ask and moderate questions that have been sent in advance. And I'd like to thank our audience, the students, the alumni, the faculty, staff, and so many friends of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health for all of the excellent questions that you sent in. I'll be sharing some of those during this conversation. With that, I turn to Dr. Fauci to begin his presentation on 2020 the year of COVID-19, public health, and scientific challenges. Tony. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Preet. Uh, well, as you can see from this first slide, I'm going to be talking today about both the public health as well as the scientific challenges associated with this unprecedented pandemic that we're all experiencing, COVID-19. This slide shows a cover of JAMA of a viewpoint that my colleagues and I wrote in January of this year and I entitled it Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. And, and, I, and I chose that title not to be facetious, but to just point out uh, emphatically to the readers of the viewpoint that we have had experience with coronaviruses for decades now that I don't think most people appreciate. If you look at this phylogenetic tree of the coronavirus family, as you can see, the human coronaviruses are indicated in red letter font. Uh, and among these, there are four, which are highlighted in yellow, which we refer to as the common coronavirus, common cold viruses, which account for about 15 to 30% of all the common colds that each and every one of us experience and re-experience, um, mostly during the winter periods of time, but year after year. But then in 2002 and 2012, we were confronted with the unusual experience of two coronaviruses that had potential as well as reality pandemic effect. The first of these was the SARS virus, which was severe acute respiratory syndrome. 
You all might recall it came upon us in 2002 from the Guangdong province in China, from a bat to a civet cat to a human, leading to a pandemic of 8,000 cases and almost 800 deaths. Fortunately, because of the lack of efficiency of transmissibility from human to human, this virus was essentially contained and eliminated by good public health classical practices. Then 10 years later, we were confronted with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, which actually began from a bat to a camel to a human and smoldered about in Saudi Arabia and other Middle East countries. And still to this day, we have the emergence of new cases. And then fast forward to the present time. In December of 2019, the clinically recognition of a strange type of pneumonia in the Wuhan district of central China, which a couple of weeks later was recognized as a new strain of coronavirus. And again, if you get back to this phylogenetic tree, you see that the new virus is in great proximity to the original SARS coronavirus, which has now been called COVID-1, and the new virus called COVID-2. And in fact, the disease itself, for nomenclature purposes, is COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019. And as I mentioned, the virus itself is now referred to as SARS-CoV-2. The present day, as of yesterday, the numbers are staggering. The most impactful respiratory pandemic that we have experienced in over 102 years since the iconic 1918 Spanish flu. Currently, almost 68 million cases and 1.5 million deaths and counting. The United States has been most severely hit. If you look at the reported cases in total cases, as shown by this heat map on this slide, there are over 15 million cases and closing in now on almost 300,000 deaths. The last count, 289,000. If you look at the cases adjusted for population size, Namely, it emphasizes the relative impact on areas of the country with small cities, like the heartland, the central part of the country. The numbers are the same, but it shows you that when you go to the prior slide, the concentration in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, but when you look at the whole country, you see that we are almost equally hit throughout. Now, if you look at the cases as they've evolved over the last six months, you could see the trouble we are currently in as I speak to you. If you go to the lower right-hand part of the slide, you see what it was six months ago, then five, four, three, two, one, and where we are today. When you look at the cases per 100,000 population, the whole map of the United States lights up. And in fact, if you look at the history of these surges, you might recall being in New York City as you are, you got the, bur the brunt of this in the early spring when the New York metropolitan area dominated the scene with regard to hospitalizations and deaths. We then came down to a baseline of about 20,000 cases a day. And then when we tried to so-called open up the economy in the early summer, late it's spring surge, bringing up the baseline cases to between 40 and 70,000 per day. And now we're in the middle of the late fall surge, compounded by the cooler weather and the onset of the festive holiday seasons with record numbers between two and 3,000 deaths per day, over 100,000 hospitalizations, and over 200,000 cases per day. That's the epidemiology. Very quickly, with regard to virology, we all know now this is a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus, with a large genome of 30,000 kilobases, four structural proteins, the most important of which is the S protein, which is the receptor binding site component of this protein, binds to the ACE2 receptor. The structural biology by cryo-EM has been delineated 
for this spike protein, which serves as the basis for the immunogen for five out of the six vaccine candidates that are currently being pursued in the United States. We know a lot now about transmission, mainly through exposure to respiratory droplets, hence the six foot rule. We also know, and we're learning more, that there is some component of spread that unquestionably is spread through aerosol, meaning particles which stay extended in the air over time and distances. The virus is found in stool, blood, semen, and other secretions. The relevance of this in transmission is unclear, but likely not important. The risk of transmission varies with the duration of exposure and the viral load in the nasopharynx. Transmission are most common now among household contacts, in congregate settings, and even in healthcare settings when PPE is not used. Particularly problematic are uh, cruise ships, nursing homes, and prisons. And factors that increase the risk of airborne transmission are crowded places with poor ventilation, particularly in the cooler fall and winter months, and even on seemingly innocent things like singing, speaking loudly, or breathing heavily. The fundamentals of preventing acquisition and transmission are these five. Universal wearing of masks or cloth face coverings, maintaining physical distance, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, particularly indoors, to the extent possible doing things outdoors versus indoors, and frequent washing of hands. Some very unusual aspects of this outbreak, namely about 40 to 45 percent of infections occur from an asymptomatic person to a person who is uninfected. And in fact, transmission at the community level by asymptomatic individuals appears to be a major driving force in this outbreak, which make contact tracing particularly problematic. Moving on to the clinical manifestations, early on the presenting signs and symptoms are strikingly similar to what we have been calling a flu-like syndrome as shown on this slide. Of particular interest is a rather frequent occurrence of loss of smell and taste, which precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. For those who have symptoms, about 80% are mild to moderate and about 15 to 20% are severe or critical, leading to a case fatality rate ranging from a few percent to over 20% in those requiring mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are protean, predominantly acute respiratory distress syndrome. However, cardiac, neurologic, and kidney injury is now becoming more commonly noted, as well as an acute hyperinflammatory syndrome, including hypercoagulability with microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon leading to stroke in seemingly normal individuals. There's an unusual multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children reminiscent of Kawasaki syndrome. If one asks who are at increase for severe illness, clearly older adults dominate the picture. If you look at the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population and compare the left to the right-hand side of this slide, you see the enormous difference in hospitalization between younger individuals on the left and the elderly, 75 years of age or older, on the right-hand part of the slide. However, people of any age who have certain underlying medical conditions are at increased risk for severe illness. These are some of the medical conditions that are clearly associated with an increased risk for COVID-19 illness that is severe. Obesity dominates, as does diabetes and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, smoking also an important component. For those conditions that might be conferring increased risk for severe illness, again, you see overweight, pulmonary disease, diabetes, hypertension, among others. We have been investigating and learning more and more about an interesting COVID-19, post-COVID-19 syndrome of individuals who recover from clinically recognizable disease 
who go on to have variable periods from weeks to months and possibly longer of lingering symptoms such as severe fatigue, shortness of breath, weakness, dysautonomia, and what some have been describing as brain fog or an inability to concentrate or focus. We are now gathering more and more information regarding therapeutics. The NIH has put together an expert uh, treatment guidelines panel, which meets frequently and produces a living document updating clinicians about the various studies that have been performed documenting therapeutic efficacy, as well as pure clinical expertise opinion. These are some of the selected therapeutics. We can divide them into early to moderate disease. I'll specifically get into a few of these in a moment. Therapies for moderate to advanced disease, as well as adjunct therapy. So let's take a look at these. Convalescent plasma has received an emergency use authorization. Not really quite sure how beneficial this is. We're awaiting the randomized placebo-controlled trial studies. There are monoclonal antibodies such as the Lilly product BAM Lanivimab, which treats mild to moderate illness in people greater than 12 years old. Again, an EUA was issued for this, as was an EUA, an emergency use authorization, for two monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron, again, with positive results showing people at high risk for progressing to severe COVID-19. The drug remdesivir has had moderate capability and success in diminishing the time to recovery as shown in a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There was an emergency use authorization for an anti-inflammatory baricitinib, which is used in combination with remdesivir, which again had a modest effect in individuals in the hospital with pulmonary involvement. Probably the most dramatic effect was a common drug that we've all used a lot in our careers, and that is dexamethasone, which in individuals hospitalized either on ventilators or with meaning high flow oxygen, it significantly diminished the 28-day mortality. And then finally, moving on to vaccines, we've taken a strategic approach to vaccine research and development by harmonizing five or six candidates with regard to their protocol, giving a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters to follow and use for bridging studies. These are the candidates. There are three platforms, nucleic acid mRNA by Moderna and Pfizer, viral vectors, add either chip adeno or human adeno with AstraZeneca and Janssen, and then protein subunits with an adjuvant by Novavax and Sanofi. Five out of these are already in clinical trials. Three have completed enrollment with rather substantial results. Just to point out the speed with which this has occurred, the sequence was recognized on January, early January. Within days, a vaccine program was started. Within two months and a couple of days, the phase one trial, a few months later, a phase three trial, and then finally results. And a matter of fact, we have two products now, one mRNA from Moderna showing 94% efficacy and 100% efficacy against severe disease. Similar results with the Pfizer mRNA, 95% efficacy, and again, almost 100% efficacy against serious disease. Vaccine distribution is right now in the process of being implemented. The first group that will get it in December, middle to late December, will be healthcare personnel and individuals in long-term care facilities. After that, there will be others, including essential workers and adults with high-risk medical conditions. One of the challenges we have is the reluctance on the part of some individuals to seriously consider getting the vaccine. As shown on this slide in a paper from Science, look at the bottom of the slide, the significant number of minorities who either don't wanna have the vaccine are not sure about it. We certainly have a chore ahead of us to try and convince individuals 
of the transparency and the independent process of developing and determining the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. And then finally, I wanna end with this slide uh, essentially urging us all, including the scientific community, that we've now had three pandemics of coronavirus and certainly the time to start is now to develop a universal coronavirus vaccine so we're not faced with the same challenge in years to come. I'll stop there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. That was uh, so important for everyone. And again, thank you for your immense leadership uh, and vision about where we need to go. Uh, I think I'll start with uh, some questions uh, on where you left off regarding vaccines. And um, messenger RNA vaccines are, are novel ones. As you reported, the efficacy seems to be uh, impressively high. What do we need to know as clinicians and for the public to be confident in both their effectiveness and lack of adverse effects? Well, um, if you look at the adverse effects, uh, one of the things that I think the general public didn't fully appreciate that if you go back in the history, as you well know, in vaccinology and you look at what are considered intermediate and long-term effects, more than 90 to 95% of them occur within 30 to 45 days of the actual vaccination. And that's the reason before the EUA is issued, the FDA demands that there be at least 60 days from the time that 50% of the people in the trial have received their last dose of the vaccine. So we're now well beyond that in both the Moderna and the Pfizer product. However, there still will be up to two years of follow-up, not only for the durability of the effect of efficacy, but also for safety. So as clinicians who are out there and having our patients being vaccinated, there is baked into this process a considerable amount of effort to continue to look at the durability of the efficacy, but also safety issues. Thank you. Many of my colleagues have asked me to ask you, have the Clinical trials included enough representation of marginalized groups, older adults, pregnant yeah. women? Yeah, actually not pregnant women yet. That will come in a subsequent phase one and phase two A trial that will not necessarily be looking at efficacy, but will be looking at safety and immunogenicity to bridge to the efficacy in the adult non-pregnant population. The same holds true for pediatric population. Those studies will probably start in mid to late January. We went the extra mile to be pushing the clinical trial sites to get good representation of, as you said, marginalized groups. And we were actually rather successful. It took a lot of effort because it wasn't easy to get representation from African Americans and, and Latinx. And we actually, in the trials, particularly the Moderna trial, which I was involved in essentially pushing the envelope of getting um, minorities in, we had more than 10% African American and over 20% Latinx. And, and from the standpoint of representation in the population, that's not that bad because there's 13% African Americans, we didn't quite get to 13, but we got close. And there's about 18, 19% Latinx in our population, and we did better than that. We got over 20, or close to 21%. So we put a lot of effort, and I think we did a reasonable job. Always can do a little bit better, but I think this was pretty good. Thank you. As you said at the beginning, this is, a, a, by definition, a pandemic is global and just protecting our country will not necessarily be the full solution we need. What are the plans or thinking about how to distribute a vaccine equitably globally? Well, that's obviously a very important question. As we all know, if we crush the outbreak in the United States and it's all over the rest of the world, that's still gonna be problematic for us. So the companies that were involved, not only the six that I mentioned on one of my slides, but also several companies in China, a couple of companies in Russia, UK and the EU also have these. 
that the contractual arrangements that have been made with the companies is to produce a literally billions of doses of vaccine to be distributed with the help of Gavi and other organizations to those nations that don't have the capability of developing and distributing vaccines themselves. So this is going to be a global effort. Uh, the, the WHO is essentially overseeing an effort called COVAX, which is a uh, endeavor to get vaccine to essentially every country on the planet that needs it, which is, means everybody. Thank you. Um, if I can turn to um, some broader questions from there. Um, this morning, Politico uh, said that President-elect Biden has is emphasizing that they want to prioritize science and scientists over politics and responding to the pandemic. Um, can you help uh, this whole broad community with the language for how to explain why depoliticizing science for people's lives matters at this time? Well, you know, it should be obvious to everyone that when you're dealing with a public health issue, uh, there, there should be no such a thing as politics because, you know, it is really a uniform effort that involves everyone, <coughs> excuse me, regardless of your political ideology. One of the real unfortunate situations that we have faced, as you well know, with regard to our response to COVID-19 is was the extraordinary divisiveness in our society, which had people pitted against each other on matters of public health, where things like wearing of a mask or avoiding congregate settings uh, without having a mask on became almost a political statement. We absolutely have got to get out of that mode and get into the global health and the public health is something in which we're all in it together. There's absolutely no room for political divisiveness when we're trying to end a historic pandemic. So hopefully that's what we will see. So if we can move into the most effective national strategy possible for controlling SARS-CoV-2 in this pandemic, what, what should that look like going forward? You know, I think it should look like a uniformity of response. I mean, one of the, you know, the beauties of our country is that we're a large country. We have 50 states. We have a federalist system in which states have the opportunity and the right, as it were, to do things the way they want to do it because of the particular unique aspects of so many of the states. That works well on almost everything but a pandemic because, as we all know, what affects one part of the country is going to ultimately affect another part of the country when it comes to a highly transmissible respiratory virus. So what we would like to see going forward is a uniformity of response where we don't have such a disparate type of response from one place to another that it's almost like whack-a-mole. You, you, you try and put things out in one part of the country and it springs up in another part of the country. We have a vaccine that is on the very near horizon. We're going to be distributing doses within the next few weeks. And I believe good emphasis on public health measures together with the gradual incremental distribution of vaccines would put us in a position we could actually truly crush this outbreak. Uh, the only way we're going to do it is if we do that all together, that people adhere to public health measures and that as many people as possible get vaccinated. That's gonna be the solution to this problem. Thank you for all of your wisdom, your insights, and particularly Dr. Fauci for your uh, profoundly important and ongoing leadership. We're all the better for it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great to be with you. I hope to see you in person soon.